All right, welcome to Safety Month and welcome to Preventing Heat Illness. Um, I appreciate everybody taking some time out today to um, uh, listen to all the things you can do to prevent heat illness. This isn't just necessarily for your work life. This also applies to your home life. And um, as we get closer to summer and uh, the summer heat starting here, this is super important for, um, for everybody. So let's get started. So no matter where you are in the summer, it's gonna be hot here in Riverside or nearby Southern California. Uh, whether, you're, whether you're planning a vacation at the beach or uh, you know, you're gonna go for a hike or you're working in the garden, going to Disneyland, um, working here at campus, uh, heat illness is a serious risk for you. There are several risk, risk factors that uh, make you more susceptible to heat illness. Um, basically, it's who you are and your physiology, whether you have a chronic disease or you take medication, whether you're um, overweight or older, uh, where you work, what kind of work you do, how strenuous it is, um, whether you take breaks, um, also the weather. So that's obviously, you know, if it's if it's hot and it's humid, it's gonna be worse than if it's hot and dry. Um, if there's wind or no wind, that also affects. So those, those are the three main risk factor categories that are gonna determine how susceptible you are to um, heat illness. So heat illness can hit anybody at any time. It's definitely more prevalent when it hits 80 degrees. Um, and it kind of doesn't matter the humidity there, but basically 80 degrees and 40% humidity from there up, uh, heat illness can be a real threat. Um, anybody can um, basically, depending on whether you're hydrated or whether you're tired, you've got enough sleep, uh, heat illness will definitely start creeping in and you've probably already had it or you know somebody who's had it and maybe they don't even know that they've had it. If you've been out in the sun and you start getting a headache after being out in the sun, or you start maybe feeling a little sick to your stomach, those are symptoms of heat illness. And we'll talk about those more specifically in a minute, but a lot of people have had heat illness symptoms and not even really realized it. It's, um, and it's far more common than you think. So every person, um, needs to understand that heat illness progresses very rapidly. So when you start feeling a little sick, um, when you're out in the heat, it's time to do something about it. Don't wait because you can go within a couple of degrees, you can go from just feeling a little sick to being in really serious condition. So what happens in heat illness is it can start to affect your cognitive ability. It can make you confused. It can make you dizzy, make you faint. And when those kinds of things start to happen, it's very difficult to do anything for yourself to help yourself. So you have to rely on others. And if you're someplace by yourself, or maybe um, you don't know any of the people around you and maybe no one knows what to do, it might be really serious. So it's good for um, everybody to kind of be aware. And maybe uh, if you're going out with a group, make sure all your group is aware what to do and what to look for. So we're gonna talk about all those things here. And we're going to do eight things that you kind of need to know and do to prevent heat illness. So the first one is know the signs and symptoms. Seems kind of obvious. You have to know what you're looking for. So heat illness is, a, is kind of a catch-all for a series of uh, conditions or um, uh, medical issues that starts with a rash. You can have prickly heat. That's another name for it. Basically you get a rash on your body and that's a, an indication that you're maybe not hydrated well, or you've been out in the heat too long. Um, you start to get a rash. Um, the next kind of progression is to move into muscle cramps, legs, arms. Um, you'll see this a lot with long distance runners. They'll be running and when their hydration starts to drop, they'll start getting muscle cramps. Um, dizziness or fainting. Um, this is also called heat syncope. This is, um, you know, where you're at. Lots of people have this where they're, they're out in the heat and all of a sudden they start to look like they're going to go down. They're going to faint. Um, that's uh, a pretty common for some people. 
And then you move in from that, you move into heat exhaustion. Prior to heat exhaustion, it's recoverable fairly simply. You just get out of the heat, uh, start drinking some water, um, and try and uh, basically just let your body adjust and come back to um, its normal temperature. But when you hit heat exhaustion, you start to get really, um, really in danger. So you might start feeling uh, nauseous. You may vomit. Um, you may uh, feel, you may start sweating profusely at heat exhaustion. And when you get to heat exhaustion, you really want to seriously consider, um, uh, you have to act quickly. You need to get out of the heat. Um, and you really need to probably get some medical attention. Now, when you hit heat stroke, that's where your body has decided it's had enough. And heat stroke happens at about, a, when your body temperature hits about 103 or 104. Once you hit that point, your body says it's had enough. And it basically, your nervous system starts shutting down your organ functions. You may have, you may start to have cardiac arrest. You may have, um, uh, stop, you could even stop breathing. You can, your liver could stop functioning. Um, it, there's a lot of things that happen when you get to that heat stroke stage. If you get into heat exhaustion and you're not actually on the road to recovery, if you're not able to start recovering, you start feeling worse and worse, it's time to call 911 for sure. Um, you definitely need help at that point because even if you are able to recover, you might have permanent damage with your organs. So here's a quick like comparison between the two. There's not much difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke symptoms. The biggest one is really in, when you're in heat exhaustion, you start sweating profusely. Um, but when you hit heat stroke, you stop sweating. Your body doesn't, can't really sweat anymore. It's done everything it can do. And it, it says, you know what, I'm, I'm done. So you stop sweating, your, your skin starts to get red, hot and dry. If you stop sweating, you're in danger. So you can see here a little bit of what happens. So all these, all these organs are at risk when you hit heat, uh, heat stroke. And your and some of your muscle walls, you know, can damage your muscles, your uh, your organs, and it can cause brain damage if you uh, are hot too long uh, before you get cooled down. There's for those that work out in agriculture, um, you also need to be aware that um, heat exhaustion and pesticide poisoning have very similar symptoms. So if you work in, in an area where pesticides are commonly used, um, kind of the difference, there's a couple of symptoms that might uh, be a clue. The pupil dilation, so you might, if you have pesticide poisoning, you could have really small pupils um, versus large pupils if you have heat exhaustion. Um, you'd be salivating if you um, have pesticide poisoning, maybe a slow pulse versus a fast pulse. Um, but those are just a few of the things to watch out for if you actually are working around pesticides. So number two, uh, drink water all day long. And this is incredibly important. So you want to drink eight ounces of water every 15 to 20 minutes uh, the whole day long uh, that you're working. And actually, you want to start the day before if possible. You want to hydrate your body. Um, and it's better to drink all day long instead of like all at once. Don't drink a gallon and then go out and work for four hours. What will happen is that water won't stay in your body. You know, you basically you'll go to the bathroom and you won't have it anymore. So you have to drink a little bit at a time all day long. So that water will will get used by your body and will be absorbed by your body. Um, so try and, you know, consume at least 24 to 32 ounces every hour. So hydrating foods are also helpful. So, you know, if you're on a break, you know, it's not just water, you can have a piece of watermelon or something, you know, there's lots of foods that have high water content. Those are also super helpful. Avoid caffeinated drinks, sugary drinks, and alcohol. Um, avoid them uh, the day of, and if possible, the day before or you know, and minimizing how much coffee you're having. I know everybody wants to have coffee in the morning, even me. Um, but, you know, 
minimize how much you're going to have. And if you're going to have some, hydrate a little extra, you know, have your coffee and then have water after you have your coffee to, to help keep, um, to help rehydrate from that because caffeine and alcohol are both diet, you know, they both cause you to dehydrate. Sugary drinks also cause some dehydration. So they're just not as, not as good for you as water. Um, the way you know you're hydrated, and this is kind of the indelicate part of the presentation, is you, you basically you check your urine color. You want your urine to be almost colorless. That means you're as hydrated as you can be. That's, that's where you want to be. Um, if it's dark, uh, you need to drink more water for sure. So for uh, departments and supervisors, you want to, you are required by Cal OSHA to make sure that your employees have access to clean, cool drinking water when it's hot out. So you want to make sure that they they're drinking fountain, bottle, bottle fillers, water coolers. Um, if you have a cooler um, of sorts, they have to have single serve cups or enable a single uh, personal bottle to be filled. Or you got to supply water bottles, single use one time containers. So number three, we want to dress appropriately. You know, dress for the heat. It's, it may not be what you think. Going out in a tank top and shorts is fine. However, if you're going to be out in the heat for a long time, you really want to protect your body from getting sunburn from the, from the actual sun hitting your skin. Um, sunburn can uh, inhibit your ability to sweat. And so it damages the skin layer and can cause uh, sweating to be reduced, which makes you actually hotter. So you want to protect your skin. If you're going to be out working, wear lightweight, light colored, loose clothing. Don't go out in black. That's not the, the right color for out in the sun. Dark colors absorb heat. So that's going to make you even hotter. Light colors reflect heat. So that actually helps cool you and keep you cooler. Um, if you have to wear PPE, make sure that you're taking more breaks, that you have a cool, shady place to be in during that break, and that you can take your PPE off during your breaks to cool down. Make sure that you're, you're monitoring because PPE makes you hotter. Um, there's lots of different types of clothing and shoes and everything out there. If you, um, you know, again, if you, the more skin you cover, the better protected you are. Um, you can get shirts with vents um, that have little mesh panels in them to help release heat. Um, you can get shoes that are vented. And, you know, some of you are, who are wearing, um, you know, uh, safety footwear and can't really change out your shoes. A good tip is to change your socks halfway through the day. So your socks are going to get hot and, you know, putting on a clean pair of socks in the middle of the day can really make your feet feel better and cooler. Um, you can get cooling towels. You can get the little personal air conditioner things on their necks. I have no idea if these work, but lots of people have them and use them. Um, if they work for you, that's great. You can get cooling vests. They have ones with ice packs or uh, ones that you dip in a bucket of water and then it's evaporative cooling. Um, make sure you're using sunscreen 30, 30 SPF or higher um, on all exposed skin. Wear a hat if you can and wear loose, lightweight pants if you can. So number four in our list is to stay on top of the forecast. So you got to be aware of what's coming, you know, for weather wise. You want to know when it's going to be hot and paying attention to the weather, specifically the temperature and humidity, or if you have access to the heat index, that's that's what you really need to do. Here in Riverside, we have six months out of the year where we average over 80 degrees. 80 degrees is the temperature at which Cal OSHA says that we have to start providing shade for our employees. So basically May through October, we have to have plans for shade for all of our employees on campus uh, working outdoors. Uh, recommend for tracking weather, the National Weather Service, um, they, uh, they have, if you put in the 92521 zip code for campus, that will get you the most accurate for uh, our campus area. Um, we have several zip codes on campus, but this one actually gets you the best uh, location for uh, getting a more accurate temperature reading. Um, you'll look at the temperature and the humidity. 
And then what you do is you poke that into what's called the heat index chart. That's also available on the same website. The heat index chart takes your temperature and your humidity and tells you what that what it really feels like outside. So if it's 80 degrees at 40% humidity, it feels basically like 80 degrees. But if it's 80 degrees at 95% humidity, it feels a lot hotter. It feels like 86 degrees. So when you start, your temperature starts getting higher and your humidity starts getting higher, the impact of the heat uh, of the weather is much greater. So higher humidity makes it feel a lot hotter. So one thing to also consider is how much work you're doing in the heat. So if you were doing light work, you can work with it much hotter out and be uh, less likely to get uh, to have symptoms. If you're doing heavy work, like say digging a trench or maybe um, uh, moving boxes and loading trucks and things like that, where you're doing really heavy strenuous exercise, you're going to have to start taking more breaks during the during the day and cooling uh, more frequently uh, the hotter it gets. So if you see at the chart there where it says 95 degrees, if you're doing light or moderate work, you don't really have to change anything. You can work pretty much all day long probably without having any issue. But once you get to heavy work, it, they really want you to work for 45 minutes and then take a 15 minute cooling break. So you can see as it gets hotter, um, they want you to do longer and longer breaks and less work time. So this gets a little bit tricky with scheduling for uh, departments. And it's something that really supervisors and employees really need to work together on and really stay on top of the weather to figure out you know, what their plan is for the day. Like if we know it's gonna be 110, we wanna know what our plan is, All right? Another thing to note is if you have kids and you're going to go out to Disneyland and you're going to want to make sure that they hydrate too. Kids, um, their body temperature rises three to five times faster than adults. So make sure you're paying attention to the little ones and uh, make sure you're keeping them drinking water in the sun as well. A good tool is the NIOSH heat safety tool. This is an app for your phone. It's for Apple and Android and it's free. Um, it actually will give you the heat index. It will tell you what it feels like today, where you are. And there's a whole lot of other uh, useful things on it. It has first aid uh, recommendations. It has, it lists all this <clears throat> symptoms, excuse me. In case you forget, you want to make sure that, you know, what you're seeing or feeling might be a symptom. Um, and it also has a timer for hydration. You can set it up to remind you every 15 minutes to drink. It'll pop up on your phone and, and ding at you to remind you to, to drink your eight ounces of water. So it's really super useful and uh, definitely worth having on your phone. So number five is to uh, give yourself time to adapt. So just like if you decided you wanted to run a marathon tomorrow, you wouldn't probably do very well because your body's not really adjusted and adapted to that amount of exercise, right? So same kind of thing kind of goes for heat. Your body has to adapt and adjust to working in high heat. It doesn't just automatically transition to do that. It needs to work up to it. So you need to essentially practice or gradually adjust to the outside environment when it's hot. So what we, we call that acclimatization. So you need to basically let your body adjust to whatever the heat is gradually enough that, um, that your body can adapt. So if you look at for workers, what they kind of recommend is when you're uh, and it have your initial um, uh, assignment, or maybe it's the first hundred degree days, you know, where where our first heat wave. The first thing is you try and do twenty percent increase per day. So you start with maybe twenty, well, maybe two hours in the sun the first day, and then the next day maybe you go to four. You increase by twenty percent. Maybe you don't do so well at four, so you want to do a second day at four, and then you keep going. And it can take anywhere from four to 14 days for a person to acclimate to the heat. 
So you have to, again, this is where supervisors and employees really need to work together and communicate on how they're feeling, what's working, what's not working to come to have a plan for uh, keeping everybody safe. Supervisors are 100% responsible for keeping their supervisors safe out in the heat and giving their employees time to adapt. So supervisors, according to Cal OSHA, you're on the hook to make sure that you're monitoring your employees for heat illness symptoms, checking in with them, making sure that they have um, shade, water, and then making sure that they're adapt, they have time to adapt to the heat. Um, that's it's all part of what the supervisor's responsible, responsibilities are during uh, high heat uh, times. So it can take up to 14 days. Um, and it's important, again, to have an open line of communication between supervisors and employees to make sure that everybody uh, is able to work as safely as they can because everybody's going to be different. Some people might adapt right away and some people may need a lot longer. So the other tip here is to avoid the middle of the afternoon. Three o'clock in the afternoon is really the hottest part of the day. If you can shift work earlier in the day to avoid the hottest part of the day, uh, by all means do it um, and or work at night. Um, it's uh, for somebody who works 4 p.m. till midnight um, when I worked in Las Vegas, it actually makes a big difference working later in the day too, because the sun is going down. You don't have the direct heat on you. It makes it a lot easier to work. So don't dismiss the later part of the day as well, but for sure, if you can work five to two or six, seven to three, somewhere in there, you're gonna, you're gonna be more productive. Your employees are gonna be happier. They're gonna, they're gonna avoid getting, um, getting so hot. So shade and rest boldly. And so what I mean by this is you need to be aggressive about having the plan for shade, knowing where your shade's going to be, knowing, you know, when I take my breaks, I'm going here and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I, I have a plan. So make sure that, you know, don't expect anybody to do continuous activity in the heat. It's really not good for you. You have to take rest, breaks and you have to cool down. Um, when the temperatures reach 95 degrees, they really require, um, especially out in agriculture, a uh, 10 minute break every two hours. Everybody should at minimum be taking a 10 minute break every two hours to cool down. That means out of the sun in shade and hopefully uh, either with cooling fans or um, other uh, misters or something else to even make it cooler. Um, your shade area, sometimes, you know, when it's really, really hot, it doesn't feel much different than being out in the sun. But uh, so you want to try and do as much cooling as you can and get creative. At 80 degrees, employers are responsible to provide shade for all employees. Um, prior to 80 degrees, employees can request shade, a break in the shade, a cooling break, um, and, uh, and we have to provide it if they request it. So if somebody says, boy, I'm, you know, it's only 77 degrees out, but I'm really hot out here doing this. I need to, I need a shady, cool place to rest. Um, you need to help your employees out and help them find a place to go. Um, be creative with your shade. I mean, if possible, shade your work area. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, if you can put an umbrella on your piece of equipment, maybe you're running a lawnmower or uh, maybe you're, um, you know, uh, whatever it is, if you can shade the area where you're working, that's even better. Uh, but having uh, cooling tents with misters or evaporative cooling fans that blow cool air, um, sitting in a vehicle with the air conditioner running is also a great alternative. Um, there's lots of shady trees on campus. Um, you know, the arches in front of Rivera Library, actually, you know, I don't know if anybody's realized it, but when you walk under those arches, it's noticeably cooler in the hot heat. They, they actually um, do a really good job of cooling. You want to keep your, make sure your shade is as close as possible to your work area, no more than a five minute walk. Um, it's just, it needs to be close enough that it's, it's easy to access and that you're not actually overexerting trying to get to your shady spot. 
So supervisors, again, when it's 80 degrees, you have to provide shade. So you have to have a plan and you have to let your employees know what the plan is. Um, encourage your employees to take frequent cool down rests in the shade whenever possible. Make sure that when they're taking their cool down breaks that they're not ex experiencing symptoms and uh, give them at least five minutes to cool. If they're taking a quick cool down break, try and give them at least five minutes. And then if you do see any signs of symptoms, initiate first aid or emergency response as soon as possible. So, um, you know, if someone starts to seem like they're not feeling well, maybe it's not too serious yet, but send them to an air conditioned building or to a car to cool down even more. And, you know, you go the next step. If they're in shade and they're still having symptoms, go the next step and get them to a cool place. I still have a question. How okay. It depends on the person. So um, if you, um, it, it's hard to say. It depends on your hydration level, depends on your own physiology, whether you're used to being outside or not. Um, so it's a hard one to answer. Um, but I do know is that after about an hour of being over 104 degrees, you are, um, very likely to um, have irreversible damage from heat stroke. So it just depends. Uh, it can be, for some people, it can be very quick. And some other people, they can experience symptoms. You know, it might be after an hour or two out in the sun or longer. So, all right. So when temperature exceeds 95 degrees, these are what we call high heat uh, procedures that need to go into place. So for supervisors, you have to um, you have to do a few extra things. You need to have a pre-shift meeting. It's required to talk about your heat uh, your heat plan. So you have to talk about where your shade is going to be, what your water is. Make sure your employees remember that they have to have their water with them. Let them know where the filling stations are. Um, you have to have a pre-shift meeting. It's required. Um, Cal OSHA is uh, pretty strict about that. So plan on those when it's hot. And you need to have effective communication between, so if you're sending employees out to a location, you have to have effective means to communicate with them. Uh, you don't want anybody working alone when it's over 95 degrees. You need to have a buddy system. Um, you can do, if you don't have um, constant communication with them, you can try and do a check-in. So either someone can drive around and check in with everybody, or maybe um, maybe it's a, they can get to something where they can call you on the radio or, um, but there's, you can do a check-in um, or, you know, uh, anything else that would be effective. I don't know, maybe if you're in visual sight, you can use signal flags, you know, like green flag, I'm okay. And a red flag, I'm hot. Um, so as long as it works and it gets the message across, uh, that's what matters. So the last part here is kind of a catch-all and it kind of ties back to everything, but it's plan, prepare, and respond. So you want to be prepared. You want to have a plan. So you got to you gotta think about what are we going to do? Where's our water? Where's our shade? Um, we want to make sure that we can uh, that we've considered all other hazards. So there might be other hazards that could cause um, heat illness to become more severe. Maybe uh, maybe it's because you're in a remote location and there isn't, you know, it's difficult to get to. So you wouldn't be close to emergency response or maybe um, uh, it could be a hundred other things, but the, the, look for other hazards that could affect what's going on. And always plan for the worst. Make sure that you know you know what's going to happen if something goes wrong. Uh, it's hard to think about things going wrong, but if you do, you'll be better prepared if something does go wrong. And it's better to be prepared than to not be prepared at all. So make sure you know what the forecast is. And it's a good idea to walk through first aid steps with everybody in your pre-shift meeting so, um, so that people know what your plan is. For supervisors, I have a couple of new tools out. Um, I have a heat illness prevention plan page document. So you can fill this out in advance. 
and then you can share this with your team. It gives you a, a, a framework to work through all the things you need to think about with your team to prepare for working out in the heat. And also I have a heat illness prevention program compliance checklist. So this is kind of like a more general, like how is, how is our department handling this as a whole and are we really ready? And so it kind of goes through all of the compliance bits and gives you a chance to kind of look at those and figure out how you're handling them and uh, make sure you are. So those are available on the website. And um, I think uh, Heather has links to all that um, in, uh, she'll put it in the chat probably. So you wanna make sure you prepare, remind everybody, and then also make sure you're doing the same thing, prepare to be out in the heat. Avoid alcohol, caffeine, sugary drinks, hydrate days in advance, eat healthy food, um, get lots of rest. When you're tired, you're also more susceptible. So make sure that you're at your best when you're going to be working out in high heat or traversing off into the Mojave Desert on a hike or spending all day at Knott's Berry Farm. Um, whatever you're going to do where you're going to be out in the sun all day, make sure you're already ahead of the game before you start. Make sure you're prepared. So for the response part, first aid for heat illness um, can really make or break uh, somebody's recovery. So the first thing is to try and get the person to a cool place. Get, get into the shade. If you're by yourself, get yourself into the shade first then try and cool whatever you can. So take off any extra clothing you can once you're in the shade. Um, if the victim is disoriented, loses consciousness, just call 911. <clears throat> Don't wait. If they start vomiting, call 911. Um, if, you can, if you have fans or misters or uh, spray bottles or something and you can spray the victim to help them cool better, um, that's good. Um, if they're conscious and not vomiting, try and help them drink four ounces of water slowly um, every 15 minutes. Um, don't drink too fast. If you drink too fast, it could shock your system and, and actually make you get sick. So slowly drink water, uh, about four ounces every 15 minutes. Um, there's a thing called the taco method, which I just learned about, it's very exciting. Um, it's called the TARP assisted cooling oscillation method. Um, basically, this is a really uh, effective heat stroke, heat exhaustion um, first aid method. So you have all you need is a TARP, about an eight by ten TARP, and water or um, I, water and ice and or ice. Basically, you put the victim on the center of the TARP. Um, you need multiple people to be able to do this, obviously. You put them on the center of the tarp and you put the, uh, pour the ice and the water uh, on their lower body, not up on their chest and their head, but on their lower body. And then you put them in there and you kind of oscillate them back and forth in the cold water. And it really actually, it, they say it effectively cools them as, as much as putting them in a vat of, like putting them in a pool of water. So it actually works. And it, all you need is really basically a tarp and a cooler full of ice and water. Um, so, or a hose even, you could hose it in there, fill it with water with a hose. So this is a really um, good method. There's lots of YouTube videos on this that demonstrate this in more detail. I'm not the expert on it, but um, if you are interested in being prepared for this, by all means, look it up. It's a good, it's a good thing to do. If there's any question about whether uh, the person is um, in a serious condition, always err on the side of calling 911. Don't don't second, don't try and, and weigh the symptoms if you, especially if you aren't super familiar. If they're sick, they don't feel good, they're not, they're not starting, they don't start feeling better after being in the shade and getting some water after a few minutes. If they continue to get worse, by all means get them either either take them to the emergency room or call 911 and have someone come get them. They should be checked out because it means that there's something still wrong, like they're not recovering. So we have a campus-wide heat illness prevention program. It is available on the website. I just updated it. And so we now have an online version and a printable version. 
um, with all the new resources that I mentioned earlier and uh, links to the NIOSH safety tool, all kinds of things on our website. So if you're interested in all of those, by all means, um, visit the website and uh, you can download all of those things and, uh, and or visit those websites. One more last thing to mention, don't forget about your pets. So <laughs> if you're out and you go on hiking, you're taking your dog, they get heat stroke too. So, uh, and they actually can get it a lot sooner than uh, people because they're a lot smaller. So it doesn't take as much to, to get them over, overheated. Um, kind of functions the same once their body temperature hits 104, they're, they're in danger. Um, and it usually affects them very quickly. So about 15 minutes of that and then they could be in serious danger. So take care of your pets too out there. And as a reminder, so you wanna know the symptoms, drink water all day long, dress appropriately, stay on top of the forecast, make sure to give yourself time to adapt to the heat, avoid the middle of the afternoon if at all possible, never schedule any, uh, you know, your outdoor activity at three o'clock in the afternoon, it's just not smart. Um, shade and rest boldly, you know, make sure you, have a, make sure you have a good solid plan there and be aggressive about it. Go for the big evaporative cooling fans if you can get them. Um, a misters, get a get a get a pump pump sprayer and spray yourself down in the shade. That'll help too. And then plan, prepare, and respond. Plan, prepare, and respond. Be ready to go before the heat comes as much as possible, and ready to respond when something goes wrong. And that's all.